Welcome to BC Law, Everything You Need to Know, our virtual kickoff event for Admitted Students Month. On behalf of the faculty, students, the administration and staff, I congratulate you on your offer of admission. And we are so excited to have you here with us today. I'm your host, Sean McShay, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Enrollment Management here at Boston College Law School. Just a little about me, I'm a native of Washington, DC, and I've served as a resource for students looking to pursue a legal education for over 20 years in several markets spanning the East Coast from Virginia now to Massachusetts. Joining me today are members of the Admissions and Financial Aid team, our Dean Vincent D. Rougeau, the Director of DEI Programs, Lisa Brathwaite, Dean of Career Services, Jennifer Perigo, the Assistant Director for Graduate Financial Aid, uh, Marcia Hill Cream, and the Assistant Director of Off-Campus Student Living, Andrew Klopstein. So first, let me go through a few ground rules. While you may be able to see and hear me, I cannot see or hear you. Members of the admissions and financial aid team will respond to your questions using the Q&A function. Current students are available to interact with you through the chat function. And if you're on a desktop or laptop and in full screen mode, uh, all of those tools can be found at the bottom of your screen. For today's webinar, Dean Rougeau will lead with his remarks and Director Kim Gardner and I will identify key resources to help you navigate the coming weeks. And the Director of Graduate Financial Aid uh, will share information on federal aid. You'll also meet, as I mentioned before, uh, Lisa Brathwaite, Dean Perigo, and Assistant Director Klopstein. Uh, once we are done sharing information with you, we'll open this platform up to the Q&A. This session is being recorded uh, and will be available to you. Thank you. Now, as the global, national, and local impact of COVID-19 continues to evolve day by day, BC Law is taking the necessary precautions to help ensure the health and safety of our community. While access to our beautiful 40-acre campus is currently limited to faculty, students, and staff, whether in person or virtually, the spirit of the BC law community is strong. Now, many, for many of you, this is a crucial time for you to determine the school that is the best fit. And we are working hard to develop options for you to engage with our community. While doing so, please remember our great location just outside the city of Boston our excellent employment outcomes, and our highly regarded and highly accessible faculty. Remember that one of the defining aspects of the BC Law experience is our community, where we nurture legal industry leaders imbued with a social conscience. Now, such a setting demands a strong and effective thought leader, a fellow Washingtonian, Vincent Rougeau attended Brown University. After college, he earned his Juris Doctor degree from Harvard, where he served as articles editor for the Harvard Human Rights Journal. Dean Rougeau is the inaugural director of the Boston College Forum for Racial Justice in America, and is the current president of the American Association of Law Schools. At this time, please welcome Dean Vincent D. Rougeau. Well, thank you very much, Son, and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for taking the time for to be here uh, and to join us and uh, for joining us today. Um, as Sean mentioned, this is a very important decision that you're about to make, and we want to help you gather the best information possible. You're here because you are we are convinced that BC is the right place for you, and we hope that you will agree. So in my remarks today, I really just want to emphasize three important things to remember about BC law. What we do, where we are, and who we are. 
In terms of what we do, I want you to remember our academic excellence. In terms of where we are, I want you to remember the dynamic experiential education that we offer in Greater Boston and the advantage that we take of this wonderful location. And in terms of who we are, I want you to remember our Jesuit mission and identity, which is embodied in our commitment to, the prof to professional formation and to community. So let me start with academic excellence. Our academic excellence is evidenced by the breadth, depth, and rigor of the educational experience we offer. Now, law is pervasive and important to society. And to understand why, you need only consider what the nation has endured over the past year with the pandemic, and more recently, with the challenges to our democratic system of government in the wake of the presidential election. Our democracy depends on our ability to exercise our power as citizens in a system based on respect for the rule of law. Not physical power, not family connections, not money. What is happening every day in Washington is probably the best example of why a strong legal profession is essential to the stability and endurance of our democratic institutions. BC law prides itself on academic excellence. We will work you hard so that you become the best possible lawyers. When you go out into the world and say you went to Boston College Law School, you will carry that tradition of academic excellence and intellectual rigor with you, and it will speak volumes. Because the law and the legal profession are so important, you will need the best academic preparation possible. It's an honor to be a member of this profession, and we will prepare you to excel in it and to be a leader in the law or in whatever else you choose to do. Now, our placement numbers bear this out. 90% of our graduates have employment within 10 months of graduation in law firms, government, business, and public interests. No law school has more graduates serving as chairs or managing partners of the largest Massachusetts law firms, not to mention our alumni in Congress, those who run businesses, and those who direct major public interest organizations, just to name a few areas in which BC law lawyers lead and excel. You will also receive an outstanding education here and our successful, uh, our successful alumni will bear this out. Second, where we are. BC Law offers a dynamic experiential education in Boston. You'll get an outstanding education in the classroom here, there is no doubt. We take enormous pride in the quality of our teaching and in the scholarly reputation of our faculty. But all of this is enhanced by relevant and imaginative experiential learning beginning in the first year. We have a law practice course and new experiential electives, in addition to clinics, externships, semesters in practice, and in-class simulations. This is critical to your learning. Not all that you, you'll need to know can be obtained in a traditional classroom setting. And location matters in all of this. Greater Boston is a wonderful place to be a law student. There are very few law schools in the country that can provide the kind of local network that will place you into a broad range of experiential opportunities at places like the Public Defender's Office, the Attorney General, a wide range of courts, and various agencies of the state, local, and federal government, major corporations, startups, and healthcare providers. This will all serve you well, regardless of where you ultimately decide to practice or even what you ultimately decide to do. It's BC Law's great fortune to be in Greater Boston, close to this political and legal vortex of federal, local, and state government, as well as in the midst of a booming economic center. Because of its dynamism, Boston is a superb place to prepare yourself to practice law in exciting settings with unique intellectual challenges. It's a vibrant and increasingly cosmopolitan place, and we aim to make the education we offer at BC Law one that exposes students to innovation across the economy, which will drive the need for lawyers in the decades ahead. And third, who we are, our Jesuit mission and identity, which emphasize student formation, social justice, and community. Commitment to education and formation of the whole person in a supportive learning community is at the heart of the Jesuit intellectual and, and educational tradition, and at the heart of who we are at BC Law. Across generations of graduates, BC Law alumni talk about the transformative impact of this community on their lives. 
Emphasis on formation means that we embrace our students in all of their variety and work hard to lead them to roles in the profession that suit their gifts and talents. Meaningful formation requires a serious commitment to, to and understanding of diversity. We welcome difference here because it is essential to creating an educational experience that reflects the real world in all of its complexity. You are going to see a serious and meaningful commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion at BC Law across all aspects of your experience here. BC Law also stands for a commitment to social justice and to creating a vibrant and supportive learning community that takes normative and ethical questions seriously. We also respect intellectual traditions rooted in faith and in non-faith perspectives. You're also going to hear a lot about the BC Law Network. It's amazing and it stretches from coast to coast. It will provide support, guidance, and friendship to, friendship to you throughout your entire career. So let me repeat my three things that I want you to remember about BC Law. Educational excellence, experiential learning in a great city, Boston, and student formation in a caring community. That's BC Law. It has been my great privilege to be Dean of this outstanding law school. I am incredibly proud of our exceptional faculty and their commitment to research and scholarship and teaching. Our bright and passionate students and our dedicated and caring staff, many of whom have worked tirelessly, tirelessly behind the scenes to put this wonderful, these wonderful virtual events together for you throughout this month of March. Thank you for taking time to visit with us. I think you'll be very glad you came and I hope you will take up the invitation to become a member of this great community. With that, I'll pass it on to my, uh, my next uh, participant. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Dean Brajot, for those encouraging words and for a little bit about Boston College Law School. So for this month, we've put together a unique virtual experience to equip you with the information that you'll need to be able to picture yourself as a member of the BC Law community. Now, there are a lot of moving parts. So please allow me, Director Gardner and Director Hill Cream to walk through the most crucial parts. Uh, and please be sure to keep up with our admitted students website. And if you'll give me just one moment, I will actually share it with you. Thank you. <laughs> Our admitted student page is loaded with key information to help you navigate the coming weeks. Uh, we'll get started with our live experiences, which will take place each Friday in March at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard through March 26th. Week one, which is today, will focus on logistics and essential information. By week two, we're gonna move on to academics. Our faculty has a well-earned reputation for being the best. I encourage you to sign up for Professor Coe's 60-minute criminal law class, where you will discuss the fundamental questions of criminal responsibility and the death penalty. This is an interactive event. Registration is now open, and we have linked uh, a download for the case materials to the email we sent you a little earlier today. So please check that out and feel free to register as soon as you can. For week three, we're going to talk a little bit about our community, and our community is indeed special. Uh, we're also going to walk you through the student experience. So you'll have the opportunity to join some of our current students for a short panel. Uh, they'll talk about student groups and other engagement opportunities. Then we'll transition to one of our infamous BC Law Trivia Games, uh, which is hosted by Trivia Hub. For week four, we're really moving on to careers and opportunities beyond law school. Our placement results and dedicated alumni truly distinguish us. 
The Careers in Focus panel will provide alumni perspectives on their experience in law school and journey to their current roles. This panel is followed by a networking event with more alumni, uh, faculty members, and current students. Using our admitted student page, you can keep up again with our virtual experiences. You can access the admissions team. You can pay your seat deposit. You can read uh, what's going on in the community from a student perspective by the BC Impact blog. And you can view tons of previously recorded content. That content includes a faculty panel, a student panel, presentations from career services, the alumni, and information about local neighborhoods and more. And so now I wanna transition a little bit to financial aid. Financial aid is one of the most important aspects of preparing for law school. As with any investment, it is important to consider the pros and cons of such an endeavor. At BC Law, we aim to simplify the sometimes overwhelming process. Our aid is generally awarded on the basis of merit through specialty programs like our Public Service Scholars Program and or loans. All merit and specialty awards are managed in-house by the law school. And all loans, especially those that are federal, are managed by our graduate financial aid team in our central university office. I will talk a little bit about scholarships and then I'll turn it over to Marcia Hill Cream with grad financial aid. So merit scholarship awards are generally offered between the amounts of 5,000 per year and 50,000 per year, where our average award is about $21,500. Our merit awards are renewed automatically each year, so there's nothing else for you to do. Our financial aid committee has begun to release scholarship decisions and will continue to do so throughout the, throughout the month of March. All students who are currently admitted will have merit aid consideration and a decision before the end of this month. And it is my hope to have them all out by the third or fourth week of the month. As a reminder, we endeavor to extend our best offer up front. As a result, we do not engage in scholarship negotiations. Now, before I hand it over to Marcia, to discuss federal aid options, I recommend that you visit our outside scholarships page. We update it continuously throughout the year. Marcia, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Congratulations and welcome to the incoming class of 2024. I'm Marcia Hill Cream, and I work in the Office of Student Services uh, at Boston College because that's where the financial aid office is uh, located. Um, we are on main campus in Lyons Hall. Uh, there are two financial aid officers, uh, myself and Elaine Holloman, and we would split you up by alphabet. So for students with the last name of um, a through F or S through Z, Elaine Holloman will be your financial aid counselor. And if you are G through R, then I will be your financial aid counselor. Um, so if you do have any questions, you can always uh, reach out to us. Uh, we have plenty of information on our website, and that's the bc.edu slash grad aid. Um, so in order to just get started with federal aid, all we need you to do is fill out your FAFSA. Um, and that's located at fafsa.gov. And the BC school code is 002128. 
There's no extension or anything for the law school. We have one financial aid office. And we will determine your federal financial aid of your eligibility for the unsubsidized Stafford loan. Uh, if you are in need of additional loans or you have additional, uh, want additional information about your financial aid um, or just federal financial aid, you can always visit uh, studentaid.gov. You will complete your master promissory note and your entrance counseling for the direct and subsidized loan on that website. And you can also apply for your grad plus loan there as well. Uh, this year, award notifications will begin going out uh, around early April. So we do not send out paper award notifications. We, uh, you'll be able to view your award in the Agora portal. So you can check there around the beginning to mid-April to see your awards. If you do have questions, as I said before, you can always email Elaine or I, and if you'd like to make an appointment, you can email us and we can set one up for you. I look forward to seeing you, excuse me, and look forward to seeing you soon uh, and hope you have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. I, I appreciate that information. And I do see several questions going up about merit-based aid, uh, as well as other types of aid. Uh, and so the law school will notify you whether or not you receive aid. So if you get a scholarship award, and if you do not receive a scholarship award from the law school, we will let you know. Uh, so rest assured, every admitted student will be considered for merit-based aid. Uh, and generally speaking, or I guess I should just refer to last year's incoming class, uh, about 97% of the incoming class did receive scholarship assistance from us. Now, I can't guarantee that it will be the same for this year, uh, but we really do strive to make sure uh, that we can help make this, finance, this, this journey a little bit easier. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, now, uh, I want to turn it over to Kim. So Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, uh, Dean McShay. And hello, everyone. And welcome to BC Law. You'll be hearing that a lot today. I am Kim Gardner, and I want to share a few resources with you and some next steps. First, I want to reiterate that what Dean McShay was talking about, checking out our admitted student website um, is a great idea. It is full of great resources, wealth of information, and it will give you a lot of answers to your questions if you still have more after today. Uh, while doing so, feel free to sign up for any and all of our virtual events that um, your schedule will allow and we hope to see you in the coming weeks. In the midst of this global pandemic, we have created a new virtual tour to help you explore the campus anywhere in the world that you may be. The tour is primarily set on the Newton campus that is home to the law school, but the tour also connects you to the Chestnut Hill campus uh, where actually Marcia works in the Lions Hall, um, and uh, uh, it also will connect you to the local neighborhoods and, of course, to the city of Boston. On the Chestnut Hill campus, we do have our undergrad school as well as our other graduate programs. Uh, another resource I want to mention and urge you to is check out our latest edition of the online admitted student guidebook. This guide was created and is maintained by our talented and I must say fabulous student ambassadors. The student guidebook is a must read. It is uh, written by students and it really will help you navigate all the different aspects before joining us this coming fall. Our students will walk you on a journey and you'll learn about the life and the times of a student, where they live and play, where and how to learn how to get around Boston if you're unfamiliar, and of course, navigate Newton, where the law school is. 
You will have many questions and the guidebook has the answers. Another thing that uh, we encourage you to do is to join the BC Law 2024 Facebook group. I know right now some of you are saying to yourself, I don't do Facebook. Well, uh, you may change your mind and we think that we and hope that you do because this is one group you will definitely want to join. It provides a great opportunity to meet your fellow classmates as well as current students and provides you an opportunity to ask any additional questions you may have, not only now, but throughout the summer. It is a great resource. And I will say that it is alive and well, not only during school, but in uh, after you graduate, alumni will still use, alums will use it uh, quite frequently. Uh, now, the Office of Student Services, where again, Marcia and um, many other um, departments work, um, they are located on the Chestnut Hill campus and they have created a centralized to-do list for all incoming students and it's named appropriately, Incoming Law Student Checklist. But this checklist provides you with a list of things that you'll need to take care of before the start of school. Things such as applying for a BC Eagle ID card or purchasing an MBTA pass, which is the transit pass to get around uh, the city of Boston. And is uh, you can buy it by semester, fall or spring or both. You would pay your tuition bill um, and tuition bills are due in early August and you can do so, the link is on this site. Information about uh, immunization and medical insurance, again, can be found here. You may be bringing a car to campus and you will need a parking pass. So parking passes become available in early August. And so you can, um, again, go to the um, incoming law student checklist to get all of these tasks completed. However, don't worry, you'll have plenty of time to get these things taken care of and rest assured, we will remind you again in the upcoming months. And lastly, I just want to give a gentle reminder that our deposit deadline for this year will be April 15th for the first deposit and May 15th for the second deposit. Each deposit, $500 and you can pay your deposit online using the Agora portal system. So uh, Dean McShay, back to you. Thank you, Kim, and I appreciate that. So those quick steps, visit the admitted student website, sign up for anything that your schedule allows. Be sure to check out our, our, our incoming student checklist uh, and those deposit deadlines, April 15th and May 15th. Thank you so much, Kim, I appreciate that. Now, I'd like to welcome one of the newest members of the BC Law Administrative Team. Please welcome the Director of Diver uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, uh, Lisa Brathwaite. Lisa? Thank you, Dean McShay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Brathwaite. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Programs. And my role is to lead the collaborative effort of the law school community in providing a diverse, equitable and inclusive environment committed to the success of all students. I work with colleagues across the student facing offices to support the recruitment, retention, academic and professional development of traditionally underrepresented populations. In my role, I support LAHANAS, which is the umbrella organization for our student affinity and LGBTQIA organizations. We're working to address different needs of respective member groups, as well as professional development programming including resume review and a mock interview program for 1Ls. Within our community, there are a number of groups of faculty, staff, and students engaged in DEI efforts, which demonstrates our commitment to ensuring this work is not siloed, but infused across our community. It's not just one person's job, but our collective focus. I thought I'd give you some highlights of the kinds of programs that we offer here at BC Law. 
Each year before orientation, our Entering 1-0 Lahana students come together in the late summer for a two-day retreat hosted by upper-class students and alumni partners. It's a terrific introduction to the legal community and provides helpful advice for navigating law school. These programs continue throughout the 1L year. Our Career Services Office and I work closely to make sure that our students are well prepared and positioned for their summer job interviews. Each year, the Boston Lawyers Group, also known as the BLG, hosts a large recruitment program typically before law schools hold their own on-campus interview programs in the summer. Our students do quite well. There are a number of similar diversity career fairs across the country as well, as special, sorry, as well as special 1L and 2L law firm corporate fellowship opportunities and judicial internships that our students engage in. Throughout the year, we have terrific programming and events such as panels on important issues like police reform or book club-like discussion groups, and of course, social gatherings as well. Our most recent event at the law school was on the topic of importance to us all, covering your authentic self in law school. We welcome Professor NYU Professor Kenji Yoshino, and he presented based on his work, followed by a panel discussion where BC Law Professor Tinu Adederan and I joined in. Professor Adederan is a terrific addition to our law school faculty and recently published The Racial Reckoning of Public Interest Law. Speaking of our faculty, our newest clinical faculty member, Alina Parik, is launching a new civil rights clinic this coming year. We expect it will be popular, as is our 1L elective restorative justice and the upper level courses, Introduction to Critical Race Theory, taught by Professor Anjali Vats, the Cradle to Prison Pipeline Project, taught by Professor Jay Blitzman, and the Race, Policing, and the Constitution Seminar, taught by Professor and former Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, Geraldine Hines. I'm happy to talk more with you one-on-one -on -one as you make your decision. Please feel free to reach out and engage with me, with me and congratulations again. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, again, I've been looking at some of the, Q the questions in the Q&A, and I see that a lot of you are really interested uh, in learning about some of our career opportunities and some of the programs that we have there. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, here today, Dean Jennifer Perigo. Thanks so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. Um, it's so good to see all of you here today. Um, I wish we could all meet in person, um, but I hope to provide you with some helpful information as you make this very important decision. And um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, you know, please know that I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. And um, I think we're going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation today. Um, I suspect and I hear that the topic of careers is very important to all of you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our office. Um, first of all, I want to talk about kind of our mission and philosophy is, is one is that it's very, very individualized. You know, we really believe that there's no one size fits all way to do law school or to shape your legal career. Um, there's really no one right job. It's, it's what is the right job for you. Um, and unlike you know, perhaps your undergraduate career services offices, our office is heavily utilized by students. We really try to get to know every single one of the 750 students in the building. Um, last year, we conducted 3,700 advising appointments with students, and, and we just love meeting with students and um, providing advice. Um, our advising team is terrific. They have a lot of career advising experience, but they also have a lot of legal practice experience in a range of different practices areas. Um, we provide over 100 career-related programs each year that cover a range of topics. And one of the highlights is our 1L Bootcamp Series. Um, that's a series of programs for 1Ls where we uh, partnered with a law student association to deliver what I like to call kind of a core curriculum of career-related programs. It's quite an alliteration. Um, to summarize, it covers about three things. One is job search fundamentals, you know, in the legal profession, um, how to write a resume, cover letter, and so forth. Um, education 
education about the legal industry in the various practice areas and practice settings. And then, of course, opportunities to build your professional network through networking and other events. You know, we really assume that um, you you know nothing about the legal profession. Maybe some of you know a lot, and maybe some of you have family members or friends um, who've engaged in the legal profession, but um, many of you do not. I did not when I first came to law school, and so we are here to provide support, you know, one-on-one -on -one or through programs for whatever you need. It's highly personalized. Um, we're constantly engaging in employer outreach to develop new relationships with le legal employers. Um, we think this is extremely important, and in fact, we have a colleague whose job is devoted to legal recruiting and employer outreach. Um, we make it a point to keep on top of all sorts of recent developments in the legal market. We run down every job lead um, and we make sure our students are among the first to, to apply so they have the competitive advantage. Um, and as I said, we get to our goal is really to get to know every single one of our students. Um, you see our placement rates. We do consistency well, it's consistently well in placement every year. Last year's placement rate was 92.7%, and almost all of those jobs were in long term, full time, law, legal, or legally related fields. Um, the quality and breadth that um, of employers that our students go to work for is really impressive. Um, as um, Dean Rougeau mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, our students work at firms of all sizes state and local government, nonprofits and other public interest roles, professional services firms and other businesses. And so I'm just gonna do a little deeper dive into each kind of common sector of the legal job market where we place our students and then feel free to ask me questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so to start with the private sector, for those interested in big law, we do very well in this area. Last year, we had 52% um, of our students go to large law firms and by that we define um, large law firms of is firms of 100 attorneys or more. Um, we have very strong on-campus recruitment programs that I can talk about today. Um, despite the challenges of the pandemic, we held our first virtual OCI just a couple months ago in January, um, during which we conducted 1,200 interviews uh, virtually over the course of three days. It, um, it went great. <laughs> our students did very, very well. Um, so we were able to kind of quickly adapt to the new format. Um, we also run a number of off-campus recruitment programs in a number of cities. Um, of course, this year, again, they were virtual, but those are in New York, DC, Chicago, Philadelphia, San Francisco, LA, and Miami. And of course, you know, if you are not interested in any of those cities, you know, we're happy to help you um, uh, apply to employers in your target city. Um, our students also have access to participation in a number of specialty and diversity job fairs. Lisa mentioned a number of the diversity fairs, but there are also public interest fairs, Equal Justice Works Career Fair, the Lavender Law Career Fair, the Loyola Patton Job Fair. We can go on and on. So no lack of recruitment programs that you are eligible to participate in. So that's big law. Um, you know, sticking with the private sector, we also do very well with small and mid-sized firms. Um, we would not be doing so well in placement if it weren't for um, our strong relationships with the small and mid-sized firm market. Approximately 17% of BC law students head into this segment of the market. Um, this fall, we held our fourth annual small and mid-sized firm recruiting program, or we affectionately call SMOCI. Um, these firms uh, recruit with us um, year after year, um, and we're just very grateful for that. Um, they, um, it's really a testament to our strong alumni um, network. Um, and then one note about business to kind of tie up the private sector. You know, um, we have seen over the course of the past few years an increase in interest in students going directly um, to work for business or mostly in-house employers. Um, this is not the, the typical path or hasn't been the typical path, but about 10% head into this area of the legal job market. And we have a, um, there is a growing, I would say, you know, appetite among in-house employers to hire students for the summer and also directly after graduation. And we have done very well in that area, have very strong relationships. And one of the reasons for that is that many of our alumni are general counsel or associate GCs or very senior um, in-house in some of the most successful companies and, and know the talent that we produce. So very proud of that. And then the public sector, and this is such an important, um, you know, 
such an important path, such an important topic. About 20% of our students head into the public tech sector. And I say this topic for last only because, like I said, it is the most important. Um, I know so many of you came to law school to serve in some way or another. That was my goal when I went to law school. And as Dean Rougeau said, lawyers are so important. There's so much work to be done in the areas of social justice and access to justice. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about this and all the ways we support students interested in public interest work. Um, you know, public service and social justice is such an important part of our culture and ethos here, no matter whether you want to go into the private or the public sector. Um, and so this is really central to our mission to support students in, in the career office. Um, you know, oftentimes it's one of the most individualized and competitive paths to pursue, and we want to make sure that um, you are well equipped for success in these fields. Um, certainly, we provide individualized career advising, and we have a lot of recruitment and networking opportunities, but we also support students financially, which is really important. Um, and, and equally important is to create a strong public interest community at BC law. So just to, to kind of tick through them quickly, um, you know, again, I mentioned the recruitment programs. We participate in a number of very large public interest recruitment programs. Um, we have a lot of career development programming, um, again, to allow students to network with alums. I just want to give you a few examples of things that have happened just within the, this semester, within the last six weeks. Um, that were co-sponsored by our office and some of our public interest student organizations. Um, we just last night actually had a public interest law alumni happy hour um, virtually through Remo. Some of you might be familiar with that platform. Um, we will have an immigration careers networking event, or we had an immigration careers networking event, a civil rights panel, a human rights careers panel, um, a post-grad fellowship info um, session with alumni, and then a federal government networking um, event at the end of the semester actually. Um, each year we also um, uh, host a public interest law retreat. It's um, a wonderful way to introduce one owls to our public interest community and upper class students and faculty and alums. It's really, um, it, it, it's typically a weekend away, you know, we held it virtually this year, but um, it's really inspirational where the whole community comes together to kind of support and inspire one another and it's a great kickoff to the year. Um, we also support students for fellowships, applying to very prestigious fellowships and, and um, you know, other fellowships. Our students have in recent years obtained the Skadden Fellowship, um, the Equal Justice Works Fellowship, the Presidential Management Fellowship. Um, they also get a number of DOJ and other federal agencies honors um, positions. Um, recently, just in the past couple of years, we've had folks at DHS and at HUD and Department of Transportation. Um, and you probably read on Instagram and, and so forth, we also have our alums serving in some of the highest levels of government under the Biden-Harris administration. So we're very proud of them. Um, for funding, uh, we uh, provide um, summer funding. We partner with the Public Interest Law Foundation to raise funds for, for summer funding. Um, we provide LRAP assistance. 100% um, of eligible applicants received LRAP assistance in the past few years. And finally, we have a very robust pro bono program. You know, BC law students logged thousands of pro bono hours um, each year. And in fact, the class of 2020, 2020 logged over 16, actually almost 17,000, 16,900 hours of pro bono last year. So you can tell um, people really, um, you know, um, are engaged in, in public service and public interest. And um, it's just a big part of the culture. Um, I also should talk about clerkships might be something of interest to you. Typically, probably about seven to 11% of, of the class clerks after graduation, both at the federal and state level. Um, certainly, there's another trend that people might wait a couple of years to hold clerkships. Um, we've been doing great in this area, have launched a number of new initiatives, and um, the 3L class this year, class of 2021, has already obtained 24 clerkships, 17 of which are federal. Um, which is just very exciting. They're doing great. And, and again, happy to talk to you more about that later. So there's a lot of ground to cover. And um, you can tell I love talking about this. Um, we love working with students and, and really love BC Law. And, and we all in the Career Office celebrate your success. Um, you might want to know a little bit about the legal job market now, um, since so much has changed in the past year. You know, the market for new lawyers is highly competitive, but I have to say generally still pretty good. 
Um, students did very well during our OCI program this past January. New postings are coming in daily at all levels, and there's still a strong appetite for new graduates. You know, I'm not saying that everything is easy, but it's great. It is not, um, at least in the in the um, for new graduates and so forth, and all of our employers, you know, with whom we work are are hiring, which is um, terrific and good news for you. So I say that about now, but I also want to say that we're constantly monitoring changes in the legal market because we know it's important for us to kind of stay abreast of everything to make sure you're well situated to jump into the legal market, not just now, but three years from now when you graduate. Um, so we're constantly updating our programs and so forth. So um, I am so excited to meet you. Um, you know, we're really proud of the lawyers we produce at BC Law who become leaders in the profession. Um, and I hope to welcome you to this extraordinary group. Thank you, Jen, and thank you for responding to all of the questions of our admitted students. Uh, and thank you for hanging around for the Q&A section. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome Andrew from Off Campus Housing to share a little bit of information uh, with you about how to navigate Boston and the resources that we have available. Andrew, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Andrew Klopstein. Pronouns are he and his. I'm the Assistant Director for Off-Campus Student Living here in the Office of Residential Life at BC. And as has been said by every panelist, I, I want to really welcome you to the Boston College community, and we are hopeful to have you here in the fall. I am going to chat a little bit about the off-campus housing search, and this is going to be a gen general overview. And I'm happy to take any questions in the, the uh, Q&A at the end. Certainly, we can also chat through email or voicemail. Um, I, I'm going to try and share my, uh, I, not going to try and share my screen, but I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the links that uh, are available for you. So what we do in off-campus student living is really kind of a one-stop shop to help students, faculty, and staff to uh, find off-campus housing, to find off-campus roommates, to work with uh, landlords through both good and bad situations, uh, anything of the sort, we are, we're here to help. Um, so we're kind of the one-stop shop for, for you. And a lot of students are, when they, as soon as they get their admission letter, are going to think about housing. That's kind of the first thing to that crosses their mind. And what I want to tell you up front is that there is really no rush to sign in to an off-campus apartment. You can start looking now, but you shouldn't feel pressured to sign on to anything. Most graduate programs at Boston College don't, uh, don't give out their admissions letters until later in the spring semester, early summer. And so you are very early in the process. Uh, we don't host our graduate housing fair, which I'll talk more about in just a moment, until June for that for that reason. Uh, so there is plenty of housing. You don't need to rush into anything. Uh, certainly that kind of makes it feel as though you uh, need or are pressured into signing on to apartment, which, you know, can, can, um, can kind of feel like you're not walking into the best situation possible. So a couple of things that I want to uh, show you real quickly, uh, kind of the resources that we have that I think will be beneficial for you are the off-campus housing website. This is what you'll see on our uh, bc.edu domain. And at the top here, you, you're going to see the frequently asked questions. That's exactly what it sounds like. This is the co most common questions we get over and over again. And so if this is either your first time looking for an off-campus apartment or your first time searching for an apartment in Boston, this is gonna be a really great resource for you. Additionally, our website has information about how to search for housing during the pandemic. Given now, thankfully, that uh, the, with the emergence of vaccines, I imagine that this will uh, have less impact on you specifically as opposed to the students in the class above you. But the final thing that I really want to point out on this website is the graduate student housing information session that we recorded last summer. Uh, this has kind of uh, information to walk you step by step through what an off-campus housing search process should look like for you in the city of Boston as graduate students. So 
while we, we won't be able to cover all of that today, uh, given that the presentation itself is 47 minutes long or so, it has a ton of great information that I really recommend you watch after, after uh, our session today. Uh, the next thing that I want to point out to you is our off-campus housing database. And I know a number of you have asked this in the Q&A function of today's seminar. All you really need to do uh, is go to offcampushousing.bc.edu. And this is your one-stop shop to find housing in and around campus. This operates very much like an apartments.com. It also, you know, functions like a Zillow, but it's specifically created for you uh, to find housing in and around the Newton campus, the main campus, really in all sorts of municipalities around Boston and Boston College. So uh, you will have full access to this as a student at Boston College for free. Once you receive your Agora portal credentials, your, your username and password, you can just simply log in with that information to get full access to the site. I imagine you probably don't have that right now and that's totally okay. Up in the top right hand corner, just click sign in uh, or sign up, register as a guest and we'll approve you on the back end. That's going to give you most functionality on the site. A couple of things that I really want to point out about the database is the housing tab. Here you're able to kind of look at listings, create filtered searches, and you can zoom in and out on the map to see what apartments are close to the Newton campus, which is right here on the left side. Uh, so all you got to do is adjust the map and more, uh, more apartments will populate. You can create a filter here um, uh, and save any searches under your, your profile. And you can click on these links, of course, as I said, operates just like a normal listing service. Um, so really great resources there for you. The other thing that I want to point out is the resources tab. It, in addition to the frequently asked questions that I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a great resource for you. In particular, I want to point out the, uh, I want to point out the rental cost comparison that is listed on this, this site. This is data that we pulled together that can kind of give you a breakdown of what you might expect to pay in and around campus. Um, this top half here will have you look at uh, what an entire lease might cost per month uh, based on the type of accommodation that you're looking to live in. This bottom half would be what you would pay individually if you've broken down between the number of roommates and the type of accommodation in the lease. Great resource for you. I would imagine uh, that uh, the costs that you would find off campus are going to be just perhaps a little bit lower than what you're seeing here. Again, this was made prior to the pandemic. So we, we have seen a reduction in some costs across the city uh, as a result. So you may find costs are going to be within or perhaps just below the ranges that are presented here. When we update this document uh, with the most current data, it'll automatically go on the resources tab of the database. The last uh, thing here uh, on the resources tab is moving and storage company information that I wanted to point out if you're looking for assistance and moving in and our furniture and houseware resources. If you're looking to purchase furniture or rent furniture uh, to furnish an apartment, you could also get a fully furnished apartment and you can filter out those apartments on the database as I mentioned earlier. So really great, great site uh, and super useful for you. I also want to touch on the roommates section here. I know some of you asked for uh, resources on how to connect with other students to find roommates. Um, this is kind of the way to do it. it. Really functions kind of like a dating service. <laughs> I, you create a profile in which you kind of note who you are as a roommate, what you're looking for in a roommate, and you can, uh, as you're searching, create filters, but also search for specific types of uh, students that you are looking to live with. This database spans across the entire city of Boston and so any student who goes to a university that 
uses this platform is able to create a roommate profile. And so you can see that Jake here on the left side goes to Northeastern. So it's a really great possibility for you to live both with Boston College students that are in BC law, that are not in BC law, but also students at neighboring institutions. Really awesome opportunity for you to both find students who don't have a place and are looking to find roommates and a place or who have a place and are looking for students to come live in a vacancy within their apartment. The last thing that I, I wanted to mention to you uh, that I uh, briefly alluded to earlier is our off-campus housing uh, fair this summer. It's going to take place on June 11th um, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. This is going to be a really awesome opportunity for you to meet with real estate agents, property management companies, and properties themselves uh, from afar. You don't have to be in Boston to conduct these searches. A lot of uh, agents are going to be showing apartments via, uh, via videos that they've recorded. They're gonna have a slew of photos available to show and some properties, large complexes, are gonna be taking students on tours of the property live them, themselves. You're also gonna be able to chat with us in off-campus student living, talk with vendors uh, from internet services to furniture rental as well. So again, we're trying to make it as convenient for you knowing that many of you don't live in the city of Boston to access the resources that we have available. One thing that in registering for this event, one thing that I, I would like to make you aware of is that if you utilize the services of a real estate agent uh, or a broker, you will have to pay a broker's fee in the city of Boston. This is pretty uncommon in most other cities and states outside of ours but you would pay the, the broker's fee, which will be up to one month's worth of rent up front to the real estate agent if you utilize their services and are successful in finding an off-campus apartment. So just know that. We, I never want to, anything like that to take students by surprise. And again, that's all listed out both in that information video that we recorded, but also in the Frequently Asked Questions page uh, that uh, I noted at the start of this session. So one way to get in touch with us is, and perhaps the easiest way to get in touch with us is the uh, offcampus off at bc.edu. Uh, just send us an email. You're also welcome to call us at 617-552-3075 and leave a voicemail and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, email is probably gonna be the quickest way to get in touch, but uh, we will follow up with you no matter how you reach out to us. Um, if you have any questions, we look forward to getting those answered. Um, and I ho really hope to see you at the off-campus housing fair this June. Andrew, thank you so much. And actually, if I can have you hang around for just a second, because the first question that I'll ask from the Q&A uh, is directed to you. So uh, Andrew, how do students generally meet income qualifications for apartments, uh, especially if they're new to the area? Um, do, and, and perhaps if they're not even working full time? Yeah, how do they satisfy that requirement with, with local landlords? It's a great question. So a lot of times, th this is very common for graduate students in particular, because oftentimes they're taking classes full time, uh, and those classes are pretty intensive. And so there's really not an opportunity to have, there may not be an opportunity to work uh, uh, other jobs, and that's totally normal. Oftentimes they're also adults, and so they may not have uh, may not have the resources that our traditional undergraduate students would in, in uh, family support. Nonetheless, uh, there, there are likely, those landlords are likely gonna ask for uh, either uh, a guarantor to sign on to the lease. This is somebody who you know and trust, a parent, a guardian, a family member, a close family friend, um, that will guarantee that the landlord receives the monthly rent if uh, if graduate students aren't able to uh, show the credit history or the financial uh, circumstances that satisfy 
that the landlord's concerned about being paid. There is another uh, option uh, that you can pursue, which is to seek out uh, kind of a, an insurance, a, um, a guarantor that, uh, through the private industry. So uh, I can connect you with folks who serve as the guarantor uh, that you, en you enlist their services to, to serve as the guarantor. Um, there are other ways here, and I'm happy to uh, to send you a document that I've created. It's posted on our off-campus housing database. If you just search guarantor, it'll come up, and a lot of those options, ways to get around um, mm -hmm. the guarantor requirement are listed there. Thank you, Andrew. I do have another follow-up for you, but I want to add to this response as well. Um, I can also um, through my role with admissions and financial aid, I can provide you with the letter, what I call the letter of proof, uh, proof that you have been admitted to the university, uh, proof that you have pending financial aid, uh, and depending upon what you approve, I can either put that in there as a direct dollar amount or not, but you have to uh, authorize me to be able to share that information. But if you do need something similar to that, I'm happy to draft just kind of a letter that you have been admitted and that you have pending financial aid. Uh, so, so that can be a resource to you as well. Not going to say that it's going to resolve all, all of the challenges that you might come up with, but it certainly would be um, a letter from the law school stating your intentions. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, ask Andrew uh, is, do students typically sign 12-month leases or are there other options? It's a great question. Most oftentimes, the, the leases in the city of Boston are going to be 12 months in, in length. Uh, it's possible that you can negotiate a lease to go the academic year, but it's it's pretty uncommon to see that. So you would I would expect that you would sign a lease for the full 12 months. If you're not going to be utilizing that apartment during the summer months, please reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to help you sublet that apartment uh, and list it on our off-campus housing database so that other students can find it. We have a guide that walks you through it step by step and I'm happy to work with students on that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so, so one of the next questions uh, comes uh, from uh, a prospective student who uh, is thinking about working during the first year. Uh, now, there is an ABA requirement that uh, recommends that a student not work more than 20 hours a week. Uh, and this information comes because your first year is one of the most crucial years of your experience. Um, there are, you know, lots of new things that you'll be learning, you'll be in a new environment, and there is a steep learning curve in the classroom. And so, you know, while this recommendation does exist by the ABA, this is a professional school, and we're not going to police whether or not you work part time during the first year. However, I will say um, that you don't want that work to come at the cost of your potential performance as a first year student. Uh, so I do want to put that out there. I know that you know, everyone's circumstances are different. And, you know, we all have to make decisions that work best for our own circumstances. And I understand that. So we're not going to police the 20 hour uh, 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 working cap that's kind of placed by the American Bar Association. Again, as we are all adults here, um, but, but I do want you to know that that part-time work could come at the cost of your performance. Uh, and ultimately, does that help or hurt your situation? So I think that's something to consider when you're weighing whether or not you decide to work while you are in school. So thank you for that. Uh, another question that I see that I'll just jump right in and respond to was a question uh, about credentials. Uh, and so once you are admitted, typically it takes maybe about two days because we update you in the system uh, and then that 
uh, runs, and then we confirm that you are a, an admitted student, and then the systems update overnight after that. So basically in about two days, you then get your credentials, which includes your Eagle ID, which is your ID number, your student ID. Uh, we are BC Eagles, so hence the Eagle part of that. Uh, you'll get your username, which is usually a function uh, of your first and last name. Uh, and you'll get a financial aid key, which will enable you to log into the Agora portal to see your scholarship once it's posted, to see your federal direct loan if you are eligible and your data has been downloaded. Uh, and then uh, it'll show any other financial aid that we know about. Uh, we will place it on your, on your account and you will see it there. Uh, as, as Marcia mentioned, that typically happens uh, in April, in early April. And so you'll start to see your scholarships and all of those things populate. In the meantime, your scholarship will come directly from the law school. Uh, it'll come from BC Law Fin Aid, uh, and you will know what your annual scholarship uh, amount will be. We'll also give you the total amount because that annual amount is multiplied uh, by three years to give you your total scholarship. Once you receive a scholarship from Boston College Law School, that will be your scholarship for each of your three years in law school. Uh, now, I want to uh, reiterate, I see another question here about when will we receive scholarships. Uh, we are currently in the process of releasing scholarships. We will do so on a weekly basis. Uh, my hope is that we will be, uh, we will have all of our current admitted students uh, scholarship awards by the week of the 22nd. So that should give you roughly about three and a half to four weeks before your, your deposits are due. But feel free, if you are so interested and inclined, you can certainly uh, send your deposit as soon as you get your financial aid uh, scholarship if, if you're comfortable with that. Uh, and we have begun to receive deposits already. Uh, once we have received deposits and once we reach our first deposit deadline, usually by that time, you know, all of our funds are committed. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense of the timeline, that process. So you'll receive your scholarship awards from admissions and financial aid, uh, and that will precede that information being uploaded uh, into the Agora portal. I know that there were a couple of questions uh, that were related to career services. Uh, one specifically was about students who are perhaps not from the East Coast and how BC Law place, places and supports students uh, in you know, obtaining jobs that are outside of the Boston market. Jen, can you help us just give us some sense of how are students who want to go back home or want to go in markets outside of Boston, how, how your team helps them? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the BC law reputation is nationwide. And sometimes people say the further away you get, the stronger the relationships are, the stronger the, bar, the bonds are. Um, and so, um, you know, the alumni network helps a lot with this. We also run, as I mentioned in the presentation, a number of um, formal recruitment programs, a um, uh, uh, large one in New York we do at BU. We also belong to a consortium of schools, including Notre Dame, Northwestern, GW, um, BU, UT, Austin, to have job fairs throughout the country that I mentioned, you know, LA, San Francisco, and so forth. Um, but I um, never suggest that students rely on those job fairs because the world of employers in each of those cities is so much greater. And so um, depending on the city that you're interested in, for example, let's say it's Seattle, you know, we don't have a formal job fair in Seattle, but certainly we can show you the resources to find employers of interest, connect you with alums, and so forth. The other thing I would say about this is that depending on your area of interest, 
um, and how marketable you are for whatever segment of the market. Like for example, if it's if it's big law of interest to you, many large law firms have offices in multiple cities, and many of them also have offices in Boston. And so again, to the reputation point, you know the strength of the BC law um, reputation and the known quantity of the talent is known, you know, throughout the firm and nationwide. And then for you know public interest employers, government employers, again, you know generally same thing applies you know and so that you're well equipped here to have the skills to market yourself for those employers in other areas of the country and i have to say finally sean i don't want to go too long but you know before i geek out and all these career questions that um it uh um you know, it's it is um, COVID has been terrible in so many ways, but you know the silver lining, of course, is that a lot of students are being able to get remote internships or semester in practice or some externships during term time with employers throughout the country and throughout the world. Hope that helps. <laughs> Absolutely, Jen. I actually do have a follow up question for you, uh, and uh, that's really kind of based on clerkships. I know that you touched on clerkships. Uh, a little bit. Um, can you talk to us about that process of just applying for a clerkship? And then specifically, if you have some information about Supreme Court uh, uh, clerkships or placements? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a, um, a big question. So we have a dedicated clerkship advisor, um, Chris Teague, who is terrific, and he's been doing this a number of years. And we have um, been bolstering our resources in the judicial clerkship realm. As, as many of you probably know, um, federal clerkships are the most competitive um, clerkships um, that there are. And, and there's been a trend in the past 10 years for people to take some time off before doing a clerkship, which means that a number of alums are applying to clerkships, which makes the the clerkship process right after graduation, particularly competitive. And so, you know, we're cognizant of that. We still have, as I mentioned in the presentation, a number of students going right into clerkships, but we really need to, um, or needed to in the past few years, pay some attention to that process. So one, we, you know, we have Chris for individual advising, of course, we have a clerkship committee made of faculty um, and also, um, you know, others to kind of help guide this process or serve as an advisory board and also connect students students to um, alums, as you know, many uh, alums, but also judges, you know, many faculty members have clerked before. And so the faculty are so important to students obtaining clerkships, you know, not only writing the letters of recommendation, but again, their network. Um, we have a clerkship database um, of alumni who, who have clerked and are available to answer questions to, again, really solidify that resource. Um, and um, just a lot of um, resources for this. We just launched this year a clerkship mentor program for 3Ls who have obtained federal clerkships to reach back and guide the classes who are um, applying now. Um, so we've really done well. As I mentioned, you know, the 3L class has already obtained 24 clerkships, um, 17 of which are federal, which is great. In terms of the Supreme Court, um, you know, that is, um, that is a tough nut to crack, you know? And so I think, you know, there are, and as you all have seen or read in the news, and this is a source of some controversy actually, that a lot of Supreme Court clerks come from certain law schools and only just a handful of law schools. Um, and we mm -hmm. hope to, to see that loosening up, but I can tell you that we've had um, clerkships in many um, SCOTUS feeder judges. Um, and, you know, again, no one really, clerk, or not many people clerk for the Supreme Court right after graduation. And so they, they do a number of clerkships before that happens. But, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, Judge Katzman in the Second Circuit, Judge Pryor in the 11th, um, Wilkinson in the 4th, I mean, I could go on and on. And so, you know, that is our, on our radar screen and um, always, always the best goal and, um, you know, we, we hope for it every year. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure. now, and one final question, career related, uh, and that's really how BC supports students looking for public interest fellowships after graduation. Yeah, that's a great question too, you know, in a number of ways. I mean, fellowships are very um, interest specific typically, you know, so if you're interested in immigration, you know, we can guide you to, to find the fellowships that, you know, would put you for, you know, put you in a position for a great launch for um, that type of um, 
career. You know, there are particular um, fellowships that are very, very competitive and prestigious. And I said, you know, just in the past years, we've had um, a Skadden Fellow and an Equal Justice Works Fellow. We're so proud of that and excited. Um, for that. Um, and so we really, the individual advice, it's very individualized advising and our director of public interest initiatives and pro bono, Michelle Grossfield provides, uh, has a wealth of knowledge and connects um, students with former fellows and so forth. So we're, we're very happy about that and have seen a lot of success. The other thing I would say is that BC um, also funds three post-grad fellows. And so generally, um, the school funds a full-time position at graduation to a 3L committed to this work. They find a placement, which is very easy. You're essentially saying that, you know, to the employer, I'll work for free. You know, the school is going to pay. And it is a great, great um, launch for a public interest career and um, very exciting. So that's um, fellowships. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jen. I appreciate that. I'll go ahead and take the last question, which I know that many of you might be thinking about. Uh, and that is... Uh, whether or not we've made a decision about uh, an in-person, a virtual, or a hybrid experience in the fall. Uh, now, personally, I certainly hope that we are uh, back to being open 100%, uh, you know, seeing the students on campus, being on campus, seeing the students on campus. Uh, it certainly gives me energy. Uh, it certainly, you know, reminds us of, of, of our community and the work that we do in admissions uh, to be able to maintain that community. So I certainly want to see everyone in an in-person experience in the fall. Uh, but unfortunately, those things are not up to me at this moment. Now, we have run a very successful uh, hybrid model throughout the, the uh, this last year or this current year actually uh, and it has been wonderful uh, typically we provide uh, options for this year we provided the option for anyone who wanted to be in a remote capacity we've allowed that and we've made accommodations uh, our faculty are able to navigate through uh, and work with students who are in person students who and or students who are hybrid. So again, this has worked out really wonderful for us this year, but unfortunately I don't have the crystal ball and I don't have the final say in whether or not we are on campus or not. So my hope is that we are at least uh, operating in the manner in which we are right now, which is a hybrid model. Uh, and then, you know, my wish at the end of the day is that we, you know, we are in a situation where we can safely uh, uh, come back to being a fully, you know, 100% everyone on campus uh, type of environment. Again, there are many, you know, uh, officials that we respond to, including, you know, our local governor, uh, the, um, uh, the president of our university, as well as the leader of the law school. So there's several layers uh, that, that, that in which that decision must be funneled. Uh, but I wanted to leave you with that thought in that um, we certainly don't know the response of how we're going to operate next fall. We've currently been operating in a, in a hybrid model, uh, and I hope that we are at least in a hybrid model by, by next year. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, good luck in your decision making process. Uh, and I hope that ultimately you do select Boston College Law School uh, as uh, you go move on your legal education journey. Thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon and have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. <laughs>